is the moment when the world is judged because it does not live up to the rules that have been dictated by the off-planet Father God. It does not recognize the power and the message of the Messiah. And so at a certain point, because God's plan is not fulfilled, this judgment must occur. The sinners are separated from the saved. Those who did not follow God's plan go into damnation. And those who are faithful to the rules of the Creator God are taken into some kind of paradise world. This, these four elements constitute what I call the Redeemer Complex. And this is what I am against. I am against the Redeemer Complex. I am warning that the Redeemer Complex is a deranged and delusional belief system that has produced and continues to produce enormous destruction and harm for humanity. Yeah, you have a quote in your book by uh, R.D. Lang where he asserted that the ultimate destruction can be done to a human being is to destroy its capacity to have its own experience and patriarchal monotheism has done this using religion as a pretext. That could not be more true. That is such a powerful thing, such a powerful warning that Liang said. He said that you can actually destroy a person's capacity to have their own experience. Now, when we go back and take a look at what I said uh, just previously about the mysteries and the mystery schools and the illuminated teachers who were called the Gnostics or Telestai, their whole purpose was to cultivate the divine potential of intelligence and enlightenment in every person. And therefore, they, they came to each individual with the total respect for the experience of that person. We are all innately endowed with the genius of imagination, with a sense of beauty. We all innately have a natural sense of what the divine is. And if that natural sense is treated properly and respectfully, it flowers and grows, and we realize human potential. The mysteries of pre-Christian Europe were human potential schools that protected the capacity for experience of each individual. Frontally opposed to that is the belief system of Judeo-Christianity and later Islam, which basically says you cannot have your own experience of the divine. You must have this experience according to these four factors. The Father God, the Chosen Ones, the Messiah, the Day of Judgment. And if that is not your spiritual view, then you are outside of the plan of God and you are condemned to some kind of horrible uh, retribution. So... Lang's quote is extremely important. Uh, um, <clears throat> I have a quick question about that. As far as the evidence of that in the last, let's just say, um, since the beginning of the Dark Ages to mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. what would you say is the biggest evidence besides um, Hypatia's death? The biggest evidence of that is... Uh, not so much in historical events. I would not uh, even start to talk about historical events uh, such as the Inquisition, uh, the witch trials, the, uh, the total genocide and elimination of folk, uh, of folk medicine, of, of, uh, of the natural and pagan view of life, uh, the uh, crimes that were committed against humanity in the name of Christianity in the New World, uh, the, the genocide of the Native American Indians. I mean, I could go on for the, for the next hour and a half listing yeah. the historical consequences, but I would like to point to something that I consider to be even more essential. This Palestinian Redeemer complex, this belief in the Supreme Father God who lays down the rule and sends his son to die for our sins, is so toxic and so delusional that it destroys the basic innocence of human beings. And that is where the real devastation occurs. It destroys the basic innocence that connects us to the natural world. 
and that connects us to our own divine roots. And by destroying that innocence and imposing a terrorist type religious ideology on the human mind, it has created these horrific historical consequences. The um, the amazing part too is the um, complete destruction of um, technology, because before then, it's they would have been by I would say by the year one thousand if they were kept going without Christianity, they probably would have been just as advanced as they are now. Probably more so, and even in a more sane way, they would have had uh, a uh, because. The technology of the ancients, of the Romans, of the Greeks, of the Egyptians, was so extraordinary and so closely related to the laws of nature and the divine laws of the universe, such as the golden section. Uh, their understanding of acoustics, their understanding of aesthetics was so profound that had the, had the tradition of pagan knowledge not been destroyed in a patient's time, certainly by the year 2000, they would have had in some respects, a, a utopian could have created a, a utopian uh, society or, or a, a series of utopian societies uh, in, in, uh, in Europe and the Near East, certainly. You know, I think it, we, this Christianity has been, been here for better than 2,000 years now or right at 2,000 years officially. Uh, if uh, a person can t actually stand back and take a look objectively, uh, the clues are right in the book that they follow. Uh, you'll know a, a, a you'll know a tree by its fruit. Uh, we have two thousand years of Christian rule, and look at where the world is today. It would it, any sane person should be able to say, "Hey, there is something wrong with this system that we have set up." Yeah, you could say that any sane person, if there happens to be any <laughs> sane person left on the planet. But there, let me be, play the devil's advocate here for a moment, because I want to raise an objection to that, the objection that comes up to many Christians. Uh, and I've known many Christians, and I grew up with Christians. You know, I don't have anything against Christians as human beings. I am definitely opposed to this belief system. But Christians as people, I don't have any beef with them at all. But one of the things that they would, uh, 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 a devout Christian would say, would be, well, hold on, hold on now. Uh, don't just emphasize some negative things that were done by Christianity. Look at all the positive things that Christians have done. And my response to that would be this. All the positive things that Christians have done for other human beings in the last 2,000 years could have just been done out of the goodness of human nature without even being a Christian. But the things that Christians have done to destroy and harm and murder and repress and terrorize their fellow humans could only be done by using this insane ideology. And that's a, a, a distinction that I think needs to be made. Well, we're guilty at birth here now. Right? What, you mean original Absolutely. sin? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're yeah. guilty at birth. And I, that one has never quit, quite sat right with me. You know, uh, I, well, that's part of the ideology that if uh, how you would never buy it's it, it, it's not so mysterious as it may sound. You would never buy the deal that says that your sorry ass has to be saved by a superhuman savior who comes from outer space. You would never buy the deal if you didn't feel terribly guilty in the first place. People who don't feel guilt don't buy that program. So people have to be made to feel guilty so that they will adopt this ideology. You know, uh, somebody pointed out to me in one of the interviews I did recently that the word pagan is used so uh, loosely, uh, even by intelligent people, by, by enlightened and educated people, uh, use the word pagan in a very derogative manner. The suggestion is, oh, pagan, oh, immoral people, uh, sexual orgy, orgies, uh, they have no morals. Uh, didn't they also do human sacrifice? You know. Mm. Well, as a matter of fact, no. You know, there is no historical evidence that pagans practiced widespread human sacrifice. In fact, the human sacrifices that have been committed in the name of Christ far exceed anything that pagans could have done. 
And second of all, uh, pagans believed in the natural goodness of humanity and in the principle of mutual aid. You will find this stated as clear as day in the writings of Marcus Aurelius, who was a pagan uh, philosopher and an emperor of the Roman uh, state. So they did not need uh, the dictates of God in order to tell them what is right and wrong to do. They believed in the sovereignty of human conscience and the goodness that unites us to each other and unites us to the natural world. That's the true essence of paganism. So the the judo-christian theologies are, are really big on duality where uh, the sophiac theology is does not uh, consider duality it considers only error that's right this is a technical point I discuss at some length in my book it touches on one of the uh, several really fabulously enlightening teachings that come from the Gnostic tradition. Uh, one of these, I, I pointed uh, out at the beginning in defining Gnostic, that it was an insult used by the Christians against these pagan philosophers. Uh, the early Christians who argued with them and who were usually lost the argument, or almost always lost the argument, were really offended and upset because these pagan philosophers and mystics were very brilliant and they had very brilliant ideas about things. Why shouldn't they? They belonged to a tradition, an educational and spiritual tradition that had gone on for thousands of years, you know. And uh, one of the things that really pushed the buttons of the early Christian uh, fanatics was this business of good and evil. They absolutely believed in the duality of good and evil. And uh, the uh, Gnostics said, this is ridiculous. There is no such duality. It's just an error of your own mind. You're, it's, it's a schizophrenic proposition in your own mind to split experience into absolute good and absolute evil. And one of the reasons that they were called smartasses and know-it-alls is because they claimed to understand the problem of evil far better than the Christians understood it. And I think if you go back and review this, the argument, you'll find that the Gnostics did have uh, a far more sane and enlightened view of evil. Uh, basically, as you just noted, Tom, they said that there's really, evil is what we perform when we kind of lose control of what we're doing because we make too many errors. To give you an analogy. You could say we go, we get in our car and we go on a trip. And we're going to drive to Malibu. Well, we can make a number of errors. We can go down uh, a number of roads uh, that don't lead to Malibu. We can take a wrong left turn or a wrong right turn. But we can still get to Malibu at the end of the day. But if we make too many errors and they pile one upon the other and we never know and we never correct any of our errors, we're never going to get to Malibu. And so what the uh, Gnostics basically said was that Evil is just some is the behavior that human beings perpetrate when they be overcome by their own errors. And it is not really a cosmic principle. There is no absolute good or absolute evil in the universe. And this, this uh, idea, this uh, theory of evil really fried the early Christians. They really didn't like it at all. Because it, look at why not. It puts the responsibility completely in your face. You cannot talk about Satan, you cannot talk about the devil, and you cannot expect God to save everyone. It puts the responsibility for human evil right in human hands, and that's what Gnostics believed and taught. That's one idea that is actually resurfacing now in a lot of these New Age theologies, uh, where uh, everybody, you take responsibility for your own actions. Uh, you're creating your own universe, you create your own world. Uh, uh, the the idea of karma is becoming real big, which basically is that it's uh, you're responsible for your own actions. You could say that I would uh, prefer to stick very closely to the Gnostic language and the Gnostic syntax, which is the use of this word error. Uh, 
the you could say that 